In this presentation, <clears throat> we will consider a few items in Matthew chapter 19 and 20, and then Luke chapter 18. Again, I would encourage you to read these chapters before watching, as I will not comment on all of the things mentioned in the chapter, nor will I necessarily go over the storyline of all the things that are going to be discussed, and that way you'll be familiar with the storyline and some of the details of the things we are going to discuss. So with that, let's take a look at Matthew chapter 19, verses 3 through 12, where the Savior gives a discourse about marriage and divorce that, if we don't understand what he's talking about, can become very concerning and very hard to understand because divorce is permitted in our time, even in the true church of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. It is still upheld and recognized. And so let's take a look at what the Savior was referring to. In Matthew chapter 19, 4 through 6, from the beginning we learn that marriage was meant to be celestial, eternal, bound by God. Number 2, in Matthew 19, 7 through 8, divorce is not part of the gospel plan no matter what kind of marriage is involved. But, because men in practice do not always live in harmony with gospel standards, the Lord permits divorce for one reason or another, depending on the spiritual stability of the people involved. In ancient Israel, men had power to divorce their wives for relatively insignificant reasons. You can read about that in Deuteronomy 24, verses 1 through 4. Number three, under the most perfect conditions, this is Matthew 19, 9, under the most perfect conditions, there would be no divorce permitted except where sex sin was involved. In this day, divorces are permitted in accordance with civil statutes, and the divorced persons are permitted by the church to marry again without the stain of immortal, Im immorality, which under a higher system would attend such a course. Number four. Bruce R. McConkie writes the following, The strict law governing divorce was not given to the Pharisees, nor to the world in general, but to the disciples only, in the house at a later time, as Mark explains. Further, Jesus expressly limited its application. All men could not live such a high standard. It applied only to those whom it was given. Earlier in his ministry, the Master had given it to some of the Jewish disciples. You can see that in Matthew 5, 31, 32. And after his resurrection, he would yet give it to the Nephites. 3 Nephi 12, 31 through 32. Presumably, it prevailed among them during the near 2,000-year period following his ministry on the American continent. I'm sorry, near the 200-year period period following his ministry on the American continent. We can suppose it prevailed in the city of Enoch, and then it would be the law during the millennium. It may have been in force at various times and among various peoples, but the church is not bound by it today. At this time, divorces are permitted in the church for a number of reasons other than sexual immorality, and divorced persons are permitted to marry again and enjoy all of the blessings of the gospel. If every divorced person who remarried were guilty of adultery, the church would be obligated to expel such from membership and to deny them the blessings and the gospel and the te of blessings of the gospel and the temple. And so you can see that these instructions about divorce and marriage are such a higher law that at the time of Christ, only few lived them. And today, we do not live the highest law of, divorce, of marriage. We are still permitted to divorce for various reasons. But there will come a time, brothers and sisters, where we will have to. And as Brother McConkey intimates, that will possibly be during the millennium that we will live the more stricter and higher law concerning marriage and divorce. 
Number five, Matthew 19, 12, concerning eunuchs. Some added background and additional information is needed to understand fully what is meant by this teaching about eunuchs. In the true church and among normal people, there is no place for the practice of celibacy. Apparently, those who made themselves eunuchs were men who, in fault, pay, were men who, in false pagan worship, had deliberately mutilated themselves in the apostate notion that such would further their salvation. It is clear that such was not a true gospel requirement of any sort. There is no such thing in the gospel as willful emasculation. Such a notion violates every true gospel principle, every true principle of procreation and celestial marriage. And that's from uh, Brother McConkie and his Mormon doctrine. Let's turn to now where little children are coming to Christ. This is Matthew 19 verses 13 through 25, and Mark 10, verse 15. And they're kind of limiting or stopping the children from bothering the Savior. And the Savior says to his disciples, No, no, suffer the little children to come unto me, for such is the kingdom of heaven. I'll let you read those verses and what it says. What I want to do is share with you a story that is told by Neil A. Maxwell that I think shows greatly how important little children can be and how profound and how close they are to our Father in heaven and that we should suffer little children to come unto us and that they have a lot to teach us. So here is a story that Elder Maxwell shares in General Conference, quoting Elder Maxwell. Children often have the thoughts and the intents of their hearts focused on the Master. Though not full of years, such children are full of faith. Too young for normal church callings, they have been called to serve as exemplifiers, doing especially well when blessed with goodly parents. Just as the scriptures assure, little children do have words given unto them many times. For example, the resurrected Jesus revealed things to the Nephite children who then taught adults and their parents even greater things than Jesus had taught. It has been a privilege to seal several young adopted children to Dan, Nan and Dan Baker, now of Arizona. Some time ago, Nate, then just three over three years, said, Mommy, there is another little girl who is supposed to come to our family. She has dark hair and dark eyes and lives a long way from here. The wise mother asked, How do you know this? The Jesus told me upstairs, the child replied. The mother noted, We don't have an upstairs, but quickly sensed the significance of what had been communicated. After much travail and many prayers, the Barker family were in a ceiling room in the Salt Lake Temple in the fall of 1995, where a little dark hair girl with dark hair and dark eyes from Kazakhstan was sealed to them for time and all eternity. Inspired children still tell parents great and marvelous things. End of his quote. Isn't that a great story of this child who receives revelation directly from Jesus Christ? that another child needed to be added to the family, and the mother had f enough foresight to listen to the child and to act upon those promptings. Now we come to the famous verses about the camel through the eye of a needle and concerning someone who is rich. This is Matthew 19, verses 16 through 26. The camel through the eye of the needle. Uh, here are just some comments on that and what he is referring to and why he uses this, I, I, I guess, parable or saying when referring to the rich. Mark, Matthew chapter 19 through 20, 
the, if you remember, the background to the story is a rich young man comes to the Savior and says, what do I need for eternal life? The Savior says, keep the commandments, and he lists them. He says, I have done all of that. And the young man then says, what lack I yet? Well, in Mark 10, 21 and Luke 18, 20, both of those state that Jesus said that thou, that there is one thing thou lackest yet. See, that's very different than the, young, the man who's rich saying, what do I lack yet? Jesus says, there is something you still lack. That it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven was meant as it states. It is impossible. That's the whole point of the saying. That's what he was trying to say. And so his disciples wonder among themselves, well, who then can get back? Can, can you be wealthy and still get back? Did he say all people who are wealthy cannot get back to the kingdom of heaven? What was it that he was referring to? Well, we have some help with this. There are three Joseph Smith translations in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John of this same story, of this same experience of this rich man. Joseph Smith adds stuff to it that shows us what he was referring to and why he said this. First of all, Joseph Smith translation of Matthew 19, 25 through 26 says, And when his disciples heard this, they were exceedingly amazed. Who then can be saved? But Jesus held their thought, beheld their thoughts and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but if they will forsake all things for my sake, with God whatsoever th things I speak are possible. So if you will follow my way, if you will consecrate your time, talents, energies, and all that God possesses to give you to help build the kingdom, then it is impossible. It is possible. I'm sorry. It is possible to be saved if you're willing to forsake the things of the world and not set your heart upon them. God, God knows that we need money for families, for clothing, for food, for transportation. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about focusing so much that we deprive our families, our children of our time and talents because we're so focused on gaining extra riches for extra things that will not matter in the long run. Now look what Joe Smith translation of Mark 10, 25 through 26 says. He's even a little more explicit in his instructions. And they were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, who can be saved? And Jesus looking upon them said, with men that trust in riches, it is impossible but not possible with men who trust in God and leave all for my sake. For, so, for with such all things, all these things are possible. So you see what he's saying? If you trust in riches, if you think they're yours, it, that you don't believe that God has blessed you with them, that you do not use them to help build his kingdom or to help others, then it is impossible to be saved with them. But if you're willing to give up all for God's sake and to be considered a steward over, not an owner, but a steward over the money and be able to do with it what God wants you to do with it, then such things are possible. Do I trust in my riches? Is that what I'm trying to do? Then I will fail indeed. Now look at Joseph Smith translation, Luke 18 through 26 through 27. Similarly, he says, And they who heard and said unto him, Who then can be saved? And he, this is Christ, said unto them, It is impossible for them who trust in riches 
to enter into the kingdom of God. But he who forsaketh the things which are of this world, it is possible with God that he should enter in. Very similar to Mark's counsel. Again, he who trusts in riches, it will be impossible to enter the kingdom of God. But he who forsaketh all things, see when it comes down to it, brothers and sisters, are we willing to forsake all things for Christ, for him, because we love him, to keep his commandments, and to build his kingdom upon the earth? Can we lay it all down at the feet of the Savior and realize that everything upon this earth is his anyway? It's not really ours. We are just stewards. So the answer to the question, can person who is rich enter the kingdom of heaven? Well, sure, if they use it rightly, if they don't trust in them, if they will be willing to lay down their riches to help the poor, the needy, the sick, and the afflicted, and to do with it things that God wants them to do with it. That's what he is saying. The rich young man would not do that, remember, when Christ, when he said, there's one thing you lack, and he said, go and sell all that thou hast and give to the poor, and he went away sorrowing. He couldn't do it. May we be able to take the things that God has given us and use them to bless God's children and his kingdom. The parable of the laborers, Matthew 20, verses 1 through 16. You'll want to read this parable because I'm not going to go over it. Just a quick synopsis is that the Savior, the, the king, hires servants to work in his vineyard. And he hires them at different times of the day. But they all get the same amount of money, a penny, at the end of the day. They all agree to that, that that is the wage. Some were hired in the first hour, some the second, some the third, some the tenth hour. And they all labored, and at the end, they all got the same pay. Well, those who had worked longer were kind of arguing and grumbling. How come they got paid the same? Well, what caused Jesus to give this parable? What caused him to want to say it? It's Matthew 27 through 30. Starting with 27. Then answered Peter, and he said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? See, Peter has been with him from the first. He's been with him the whole time. He's been with him the longest. Verse 28. And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, Ye shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So Peter gets an insight to what one of his future callings will be, will be to judge the twelve tribes of Israel. 29. And everyone that hath forsaken house, or brother, or sister, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive an hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. It doesn't matter for how long they have done it. It doesn't matter if you join the church and you were born into it and then were baptized at eight and you remain faithful ever since, or at age 50 the missionaries find you and you join the church, and then from then on you live the gospel. You will still get the same reward of everlasting life if you endure to the end and stay faithful. Verse 30 but many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Now, in the book of Mark, Mark tells this same story and quotes these almost same words, but he adds the following in Joseph Smith's translation of Mark 10.31, which says this, meaning the things I have just read, this, he said, rebuking Peter. See, it sounds like Peter had a little burst of pride and was wondering, hey, we've been with thee the longest. Shouldn't we receive the greater blessings? 
Some of these have joined, you know, months. Uh, we know his ministry lasted three years. A year later, we've been with you from the very start. Shouldn't we be getting more? So that's what it sounds like Peter is saying, because it says this he, Christ, rebukes Peter. This, this then immediately, Jesus gives the parable of the labors, that it doesn't matter when you labor, as long as you labor with all your heart, heart, might, mind, and strength, and endure to the end, you will all receive the same reward. And so Jesus immediately gives the parable of the labors, which basically states that regardless of when you started serving the Savior in his kingdom and endure to the end, the reward is the same. People who join the church today and stay faithful and endure to the end will receive the same reward as me who has been in the gospel for over 60 years and has been trying to follow the Savior the best he can. And so it doesn't matter when you start the gospel, it matters how you live the gospel. And if you endure to the end, we all will receive the same reward. In Luke 18, verses 1 through 8, is the parable of the unjust judge. Remember, this is where the widow lady keeps coming to him, to avenge her of her enemy and he kind of ignores her and she just keeps coming and coming and coming and so finally he listens to her and avenges her of her enemy well what caused Jesus to give this parable that's in Luke chapter 17 verses 20 through 37 we'll read part of these this is why he gives the parable Verse 20, and when he was demanded the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God come not with observation, meaning they confused Jesus' first coming with the second, looking for all of the signs, meaning observations, of his second coming. I mean, there's going to be a lot of signs of his second coming. His first coming was not with those signs or what they called observations. And that's why they were missing who he was. All those signs were not following his first visit because he was under direction to save them spiritually, not physically, from the Romans and those kinds of things. Verse 21, Neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is with you. Or the Joseph Smith translation has already come unto you. The kingdom was already among them. Jesus had established his church. Don't listen to others. It's already here. I have already established it. 22. And he said unto his disciples, The days will come when ye, or the Joseph Smith translation changes it to they, meaning the Pharisees, shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and ye, or they, shall not see it. In other words, there's going to be a state of apostasy. They, the Pharisees, because of apostasy, could or would not see the kingdom of Christ that had been set up by Jesus Christ. Verse 23, And they say, and they say unto you, See here or see there, go not after them, nor follow them. Meaning, do not follow false prophets who claim to have set up God's kingdom. 24. For as the light, for as the lighting that lighteneth out of the other parts of heaven shineth unto the other parts of heaven, so also shall the Son of Man be in that day. And so he's talking about there's going to be a restoration. Christ's second coming will be first brought about by the restoration of his gospel, which will be like the sun slowly rising. The, the restoration you and I have lived through, no, it just didn't happen immediately in a snap and boom, it's here. And all of a sudden, no, it's like the rising sun. It slowly rises 
as you get more and more light. And that is what the restoration was going to be like, that it would continually to rise just like the sun and give more and more and more light. Verse 25, but first must suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. And, and before the second coming, there will be much suffering because people's rejection of Christ and his gospel. Verse 26, And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, and they did drink, and they married wives. They were given a marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. In other words, Christ's coming is going to come where things are just happening normally. It's going to happen naturally. People will be going to work. People will be on vacation. People will begin marriage. People will be married. They'll be with families. They'll be given in marriage. In other words, life will continue, and they'll be caught unaware because they were not prepared. They were not waiting for the Savior. They were just going about the normal things of life. Verse 28, Likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. See, just as time as Lot with Sodom and Gomorrah, they were going naturally about life, doing the natural things you do down here on earth. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Again, it came as a thief in the night. They were not ready. They were participating in the normal things of mortality and then all of a sudden, it came. Verse 30, Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. 31, In that day he which shall be on the housetop, and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. You won't have time when the destruction comes, and when the events of the second coming happen. You won't have time to go into your house and to look for all of your keepsakes and everything you want to take and get everything ready. You will just need to leave. The same as if you're in the field or at work, you'll just need to leave to avoid the suffering and the destruction that is going to take place. Remember Lot's wife. Remember her? She went back into Sodom and Gomorrah. That's the, that's the inference from him now saying, remember Lot's wife, right after saying, don't return back from your field. It sounds like she didn't just turn around and turn it into a pillar of salt, that she actually went back into Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember, she had children there that wouldn't leave. And she goes back into there, maybe to persuade them to leave, to come with her, to be with them. Uh, maybe did not want to be separated from them, and she gets caught up in the destruction because she does not leave when she needed to. Thus the parable of the unjust steward, that like the widow, we should pray always and not faint. Don't give up when your cause is just. Have faith in the Savior to the end. So... After all of those teachings I just read, then he gives the parable of the unjust judge and the widow who's constantly, constantly talking to him about avenging her of her enemies. We should constantly be talking to the Savior about the signs of the second coming and praying and telling, asking him to help us to know the signs to help us not faint and to be prepared and to pray always so that we stay faithful to him. So you can see why he gives this parable after giving all of those other instructions in trying to teach the parable of be like this widow lady, constantly be in communication with the Savior and our Father in heaven and being prepared for the times that are to come. Luke 
Joseph Smith translation of Luke 18 verse 8 says, I tell you that he will come, and when he comes, he will avenge his saints speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man come, shall he find faith on the earth. So first of all, when he comes, he says he will avenge his saints, those who have been killed. He will bring judgment immediately, speedily, he says, upon the inhabitants that are left that will be cut up in the destruction. The way to get out of that is to have faith in Jesus Christ and faith in his plan and in his church and in the covenants we must keep so that we can be caught up with the Savior when he comes. And so when he says, will he find faith on the earth? Well, brothers and sisters, that's up to you and me. Whether there is faith found upon the earth when Christ comes is dependent upon us. So the question is, will I have faith on the earth when Christ comes? That's what we need to prepare for. That's what we need to contemplate. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button and please subscribe consider subscribing to the channel.